Good morning. morning. Well, um, how was your week at uh, Cherry Festival? How many of you didn't go? (laughs) Well, I don't know where all those people were coming from, but uh, my, uh, my granddaughter and my grandson are here still, and that's good. But my granddaughter believes that it's part of her vocation in life to attend every parade and most of the events that are affiliated with uh, Cherry Week. So I am really tired. <laughs> but it's great to see you. And, and um, some of you have actually questioned me recently about whether or not I really do any work in Florida. That's a, that's a, that starts with Pastor Jeff, and I'm, I'm going to prove to you that I do by introducing you to one of the members of our church at Mariner Sands, and who lives here in Traverse City. Carol, stand up. I'm completely embarrassing her. This is Carol Nelson. She lives just down the... Go, go ahead. Yeah. Now, remember what I told you to say. I, <laughs> I didn't <write> <laughs> he didn't write it down. <laughs> Carol's part of our church, the chapel of Mariner Sands. With her is her, her neighbor and friend and her daughter who comes and visits us also. So um, now I have three, uh, two witnesses um, that indeed that's the case. But we're glad to be back here. And we're, I'm going to be with you preaching at least through uh, the middle of August, I think. August 9th or something. Is that correct? And... Um, I saw Jeff during the week on vacation in the parade, the children's parade. Horses and, uh, is it llama or is there another name for it? Alpaca, I don't know. See, the guy's got more animals at his place than than I have family. But nevertheless, uh, we're hoping he's having a great week. And I want to read scripture to you this morning from uh, St. Paul's writings. This, the this letter we know is 2 Corinthians. And uh, it should be on the the screen behind you. Now, beginning in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 1. For our, bo- our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity or holiness and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. Because I was sure of this, verse 15, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia, which is Greece, and to come back to you from there and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and then no, no at the very same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and who has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The word of the Lord. Um, Teresa Brionis is a tender, loving mother. I also understand by the grapevine she has a great left hook, but I'll explain that later. Some kids were making fun of her daughter, Alicia. Alicia is bald. Her knees are arthritic. Her nose is pinched. Her uh, hips are creaky. Her hearing is poor. She has the stamina of a 70-year-old, but she is only 10. Mom, the kids taunted, come and look at the monster. Alicia weighs 22 pounds, is shorter than most preschoolers. She suffers from a disease called progeria, a genetic aging disease that strikes one child in eight million. The life expectancy of those with this disease is 20 years. She is not an alien. She is not a monster, Teresa defended. She is just like you and me. 
Mentally, Alicia is a bubbly, fun-loving third grader. She has a long list of friends. She watches television in a toddler-sized rocking chair. She plays with Barbie dolls, teases her younger brother. Her mother has grown accustomed to the glances and the questions. She's patient with the constant curiosity. Genuine questions she accepts. Insensitive slanders she does not. The mother of the finger-pointing children came to investigate that day. I see it, she told the kids as she glanced at Alicia. My child is not a, an it, Teresa stated. And that's when she decked the woman with her left hook. <laughs> I love that story, not because I have a very good left hook, but really, who could blame a mother of any child, let alone a child with those kinds of challenges. The reality is, mothers and fathers have a God-given capacity to love their children regardless of their imperfections. How many of you raised uh, perfect children? <laughs> yeah, remember, God hates lying. <laughs> um, now, some of your kids are pretty close to that, and I know your grandkids, we can't measure grandkids because that, that, that's a whole different scale. But no one in this room raised perfect kids any more that we were raised to be perfect. And it's not because parents are blind. The fact is, they see more vividly, more clearly than others. Teresa sees all of her daughter Alicia's imperfections. She sees them better than anyone. She sees them 24-7. But more importantly, she sees her daughter's value and potential. So does God, our Father. God sees us with the eyes of a father. He sees your imperfections. He sees our defects. He sees my sins. He sees my blemishes. But more than that, he sees our value, our potential. And I believe that in some measure, St. Paul would have understood uh, that mother, Teresa's left hook. Not because Paul was a fighter so much as he felt like Teresa's daughter. Laughed at, mocked, slandered, belittled, name-called. His value as a person, his value as a, as a church person, as an apostle was, was systematically and carefully dismantled by some people in churches, including this church in the city of Corinth in Greece, the church that St. Paul started. He was no longer in the area. He, he kind of just came in, did what he needed to do, and, and went on. I think the longest he stayed anywhere in one place at one church was three years, but he started this church in Corinth. Now he's gone on to, to establish places for, for Christ and his people to gather, and there were people left in the church in Corinth who were lobbing some pretty extreme grenades into the congregation in an effort to damage St. Paul's reputation and his integrity. St. Paul wanted to come back and visit them. They wanted him to stay away. St. Paul wants to communicate with them. They want to criticize him. He wants reconciliation. They want revenge. He wants forgiveness. They want to fight. He wants to extend grace. They want to nurture a grudge. He wants to offer mercy. They want to offer misunderstanding. He wants to deliver love. They want to deliver a left hook. And yet, true to who St. Paul was, he did what few of us would do. He kept reaching out to this very same group of people with grace. St. Paul does what we should always be ready to do he reaches out to them through a letter which he hoped would, would straighten things out, um, shift what was wrong in their eyes to that which was right. Listen again to verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. 
the next several weeks that we are together, last week was the first for this summer, I introduced to you the person of grace, the person of grace and truth. That person so impacted Paul's life that everything he did from the moment of his Damascus conversion, as we heard in our prayer time, was to be motivated by that grace and that truth. And he wanted the truth to triumph in Corinth, but he also wanted them to be embraced by grace, grace that he was still willing to extend to them. And only when we have a deep and abiding understanding and experience of gratitude for God's grace in our life could we be motivated to try to generate that kind of response to people, even those who misunderstand us? And grace enabled St. Paul to rise above the misunderstandings that were going on with that group of people. Now, when you rise above misunderstanding and you seek reconciliation or at some level grace, understand this, that doesn't mean that you were not hurt by what happened. It doesn't mean that you didn't feel badly because of what that person said or did. St. Paul certainly did. It means, though, that he operated with the principles and wisdom of grace in his life, not the principles and the wisdoms of his culture. And I'll show you that right now, but also remember this. You can operate in grace, you can live in grace, and people can reject it. It doesn't mean when you continue to be motivated by grace in your life that someone's going to suddenly look at you and put on a new pair of lenses and say, wow, everything's great. That's not what happened here. But, but look at how Paul phrases himself at the end of verse 12. We behaved, he says, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. That's the phrase, not by earthly wisdom. The wisdom of St. Paul's culture, the wisdom of our culture, of our moment, of our day, would say, if you've been mishandled, if you've been mistreated, if you've been misunderstood in relationship, the wisdom of our culture would say what? Nail them. Get your revenge. Nurse your bitterness. Plot retaliation. Ferment in anger. Exaggerate your, the criticism and resolutely refuse to move forward beyond the pain given what they did to you. That's not the wisdom, St. Paul says, we live by. The wisdom that he lived by was the grace of Christ. Extend to that person. Extend to that individual God's grace. Extend to them the inexhaustible capacity to forgive. Include them don't exclude them. That was Paul. You say, well, <clears throat> is that really what, what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. For the people who are motivated by grace, not the culture, <clears throat> not the wisdom of our age, that's where we must go because that is how God has dealt with us. And in fact, to help us understand that, to, to be able to take home <clears throat> this one principle, I will live under the grace of God motivated in my life so as not to surrender to the wisdom of the culture, which invites me to retaliate, to seek revenge, and all of that. I'll do what I can to continue to walk and live in grace. Paul gives us three illustrations of how God has established grace and continues to establish grace with you and I who are followers of his. Um, read with me verses 21 and 22 of this chapter. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. These two verses are, are perhaps the most God-centered God-focused paragraphs in, in all of St. Paul's writings. Why would that be the case? Why would St. Paul, in the middle of a story about being misunderstood and misrepresented, suddenly become so God-focused? Even though St. Paul had been rejected by some people, even though certain people betrayed him and retaliated against him, Paul knew someone 
who had not misunderstood or misrepresented him and never would. Paul knew someone who, who had treated him in the way of grace. And, and that's what I want us to see here. Verse 21 says, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm, or who establishes us. Now, if the wisdom of the culture were writing these words, the words that are not there, if, 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 the, right, if the wisdom of our culture were writing this sentence, we would write it differently. It is not, we, we wrote, we see in the scriptures, now it is God who establishes us or makes us stand firm. If we were writing that under the wisdom of our culture, we would have written this. Now it is God who makes me stand firm. Now it is God who establishes me. But you, you, God has no time for. You, God trips up. You, God nukes just for fun. Now, just, you don't have to, you don't have to tell the truth, but the truth is, if we were rewriting the verse under the wisdom of our culture, that's exactly how we would write it. And that's exactly what our culture wants us to do. We as people of grace don't serve a God like that. We serve the God who helps his sons and daughters to be established in faith, to be standing firm in faith. See, what St. Paul's trying to do is he's trying to get beneath the little squabbles that happen among Christians throughout the body of Christ, and he wants them to remember the spiritual realities that, that, that were the foundation on which they began to build their faith. These Christians needed to have their attention called back to the unique character of their faith and realize that they all shared a foundation of grace. And that's what these two verses are about. Verse 21 again. And it is God who establishes us with you. What does St. Paul mean? Simply this. When everything about our relationships with others is falling apart, understand that our relationship with God is not. Grace anchors your relationship to God with stability, with firmness. He establishes you in that position by faith. Your standing, my standing with God, is not subject to change. Your relationship is not on one day and off the other from God's point of reference. He makes you to be established in faith in Christ. <clears throat> Most of us are ready for grace a long time before we realize we're ready for grace. We're ready for grace when we're bone tired of our struggle to try to make ourselves worthy and acceptable in people's eyes. And after you have tried too long to earn the approval of everyone important to us, very often within our family system, when we work too hard to, to try to win that and not, we're ready for grace. When we're, when we're tired of trying to be the person somebody at some time convinced us we had to be, we're ready for grace. When we have given up all hope of being acceptable to other human beings we value, we're ready for grace. And that's what St. Paul is saying. He's saying all your relationships, and he's talking about the church. He's not being a denier of truth. He's saying sometimes in the church it gets messy. And when it gets messy, it hurts, and it damages, and it leaves scars. But don't fall for the wisdom of the culture and slide under that riptide that will drag you out. He says, stay above the culture, stay above the riptide, walk in grace, be motivated by grace, continue to extend that grace because God is assisting you already. He is establishing you. He is helping you to stand firm in your faith. Amen. And then, then look at this. Also at the end of that verse, he establishes us with you in Christ and he's anointed us. St. Paul is going back to the very first day these individuals embraced Christ by faith. And on that day, the scripture tells us, God gave all those who embrace him by faith the gift of his presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. You say, explain that to me. 
I can't. It, it's, it's, it's one of the, the mysteries of God that, that, we, that we embrace and we walk in faith and we believe. Most everyone in this room and in this city walks by faith. When you went downtown yesterday to go to the parade, you drove by faith that there would be a parking spot somewhere within reason so that you wouldn't have to hike in from Target. You drove in by faith. Every time you hop on your boat to go fishing, you hop in faith, believing that you didn't take the plug out of the back end of the boat to drain it and leave it out. You step into the boat in faith. People in our culture who decry Christianity and faith are people who don't look carefully at their own lives. They walk in faith every single day. The problem is they don't mind admitting they walk in faith according to the earth's wisdom. They don't want to admit that they need faith in Christ's wisdom. And that's the dividing line in our culture, and I, I can't get into that. Paul here says, you stand firm in your relationship in Christ. But then he says you're anointed. The verb anointed means that God, by his giftedness, his giving nature, gives to you the Holy Spirit in, in, your, in your person. And that, the Spirit begins to transform you and, and mold you and shape you. And sometimes that's a painful process. We call them growing pains in any other part of our life. But he also provides you with giftedness, gifts that you may or may not be aware that you had. And, and he provides them to you out of his grace. He anoints you with the Spirit, but more than that, the word anointing in the Old Testament was, just, was used to describe the beginning of a king's reign or a prophet's ministry. In the New Testament, the verb anointed was often used to describe healing. So what does that mean for the Christian who is established in faith in Christ? It means that God obviously sees you as valuable. He sees you and he equates you to be as valuable as a king or a prophet. In addition to that, it God, God trusts you and sees you as worthy of, of his presence and he gives you gifts. Gifts that you don't deserve or I don't deserve, but he honors you with those gifts. And thirdly, he brings healing. That's the other word of anointing. He brings healing into our brokenness so that even out of brokenness, we can move forward into wholeness, into healing. St. Paul says that as you come to faith in Christ and are immersed by his grace, God stands you firm. He stands you upright. He plants your feet. He establish you, establishes you spiritually in a foundation of faith. And furthermore, he pours over you. He doesn't drip it on one drop. But he just pours over you his spirit. His spirit is the presence of God who will go with you and begin to change your life as you yield to him and walk in faith. Furthermore, that same Holy Spirit provides the inspiration for gifts in your life, gifts that you can use to serve the body of Christ. And in addition to that, that spirit anoints you. You are on the level playing ground with a king ruling a country, with a prophet serving the prophetic ministry of the, world, of the church. You are being anointed so that the brokenness of your life, the, the, the pieces that are scattered and make no sense, come together and there can be wholeness and healing in your life. God declares you by the act of anointing as useful, honorable, valuable, as people who can make an incredible contribution to your world and to your church. His anointing means we are needed, not ignored. We are useful, not discardable. Gifted, not guilty. Valuable, not worthless like everybody else sometimes seems to think about us. How many of you have been to places, not necessarily churches, but I'm sure it's churches, where it didn't take you long to figure out you were discardable? Uh, they, everyone there in that little group or that little party had all the gifted people they needed themselves. And you were not going to be a part of that party. They didn't say it that way. They just didn't let you get in. You were never part of the group. 
That's what St. Paul is saying. You don't have to worry about if you're truly walking in faith. God has a place for you because he has, he has set you on firm, established ground and on that ground anointed you. Furthermore, the last thing, look at what St. Paul says. He made you a forever part of his family. Just in that verse. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. He's anointed us, now verse 22, and who has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Paul says he has put his seal on us. <clears throat> That's the idea of seal of ownership. The, world, the word seal in, in the New Testament comes from the world of business, the corporate world, and, and referred to the means by which money, goods, or documents were secured for delivery. A seal on the goods was a mark not only of ownership and that the goods were what they said they were, but also that they had not been tampered with or falsified in transit. Remember the old days when you used to write letters by hand? How many of you remember that? Some of you may remember, it was a fad for a period of time where you had wax seals. Remember this? And you had your initials or some heart or something like that or maybe a logo of a team, I can't imagine. And, and, and then you would melt the wax, and while it was still liquid, you'd melt it right on top of the leather where it sealed, and then you'd stamp it. And you did that. I know why you did it. You did it to impress people, but really, why we did it was to show this letter has not been opened. This letter is from me. That's my seal. That's my mark. And uh, that's what St. Paul is talking about here. Only that's what God has done for us. God's put his stamp, his initials on us. And what this means, the seal of ownership, is that God looks at you and says, she's mine. Never will you hear from God the Father the words, he's no longer my son. He looks at Donna and he says, she's part of my family. He glances at Ken. Well, maybe not Ken. But he, glances at, <laughs> he glances at Ken and he thinks, that's my boy. He, he winks. He winks at John and whispers, I love you. Glad you're mine. And he, and he, and he bumps into Sally. And he exclaims, welcome home. I've been waiting for you. The seal of God's ownership means you are accepted. It means you are loved. It means you are valuable in God's eyes. Our culture wants us to believe that the only value worth having is if we're valued by other people. All of us want love from others. All of us want to be in relationship. But that kind of wisdom sidetracks us from what God designs for us first. And that is that we're valuable and accepted by him. And if that doesn't blow you away, then he says one other thing. <clears throat> he says at the end of verse 22, and God has given us his spirit in our hearts as a Guarantee. Some, some verses, some English translations say as a deposit. That word in the Greek culture even today, even with all the troubles that are in Greece today, that word means, can I see your wedding hand? That word today in Greek means engagement ring. And when St. Paul says that God has given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, he says, we're connected. We're engaged. You are in my future. The inheritance of heaven is assured for you because of that guarantee. The gift of God's Holy Spirit is God's pledge of love to you of greater things to come in your relationship with him. 
The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, God loves you simply because he's chosen to love you. He loves you when you don't feel loved. He loves you when no one else seems to love you. Others may abandon you. They may divorce you. They may separate from you. They may ignore you. They may misrepresent you. They may never want to speak to you again. But God the Father, St. Paul says, will always love you. He will always love you no matter what. With God, you are not going to be misrepresented. In the final analysis, you will never, ever be mistreated, misdiagnosed, discarded. Indeed, you are forever welcome as one of his own, and you will be embraced, you will be forgiven, and you will be accepted forever. Remember these words? If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a wallet, your pictures of the family would be in it. If God had an automobile, the bumper sticker would read, my children are honor students in Heaven's Academy. If God had a family portrait taken, you'd be in the front row rather than cut out. And if God provided scholarships, <clears throat> yours would be a full ride for eternity. And if God lived in Traverse City, he'd want to live next door to you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the word of the Lord, the, the truth of Scripture that bonds with the grace of God is always a formula for living above the bar that our culture has set so abominably low, which our government has attempted to change and modify and disrupt. Father God, may we continue to walk the higher road, the road of grace, because you sent your son to walk that road before us, a road that ended on the cross and in the grave, but a road that also broke through the strains of death. And you have established us in Christ. You have anointed us in Christ. We are the king's kids. We are prophetic and regal. We are destined for wholeness and then you have you've, you've made us a part of your forever family with the seal of ownership stamped on us and the engagement ring of your spirit in our lives help us to walk in that path Amen <laughs>